him on first of your long. Adramidilbum, that it well, El Yarrow, Halan a mast. Shop him, Hert Naman. Saith his word as your old weed a hound. He belt ne alech, Pergas Darda. Sing at Simla, sell a leave the hair on horn yell. Hail the will my bad, Laran Lees. Nay, was it lingeth our ye, that the edge had the Adam swear on, after a while neither whack nor shoulder. I've been reading from a section of Beowulf which describes the, the victories of King Hrothgar and his desire to build a big hall to hold uh, feasts and parties with his warriors and to pass out the booty from, the, uh, from his expeditions. And it ends with a description of the monster Grendel listening to the sound of harp playing and singing in the hall. And we hear the little creation song at the end in which Grendel is listening from outside as the bard sings about the beginning of the world. I have to admit this is the first time I've ever done a reading from a book like this. And it seems kind of strange to me. It seems uh, unnatural even. Uh, because I'm, I'm in conflict with uh, the fact that I'm following a text on the page when all of my instincts are telling me to do something else. And of course, my hand wants to be playing the harp. Um, and it's, it's interesting for me to have to do that. But I wonder uh, um, if that might lead us to ask the question, uh, is this a book? Is this literature? Is this a poem to be read like I just read it? or? Am I doing something here which is completely, uh, completely false and completely unnatural? What do you think? Well, I might jump into that. Uh, I think first and foremost, what you're doing is a, a story. And stories are before the advent of, of books and perhaps more importantly, mass readerships um, are primarily stories. And the very fact that it's done as a performance means that the problem of reception is entirely different. I think it's very easy to forget that this is a performance and therefore performer audience amalgam. And if we forget that there's an ongoingness to it, you can't go get a cup of tea and come back. Uh, this is something that's happening now, it's imminent, and it's ongoing. That's really the stuffings of the story, I think, as much as any kind of authenticity might lie in reconstructing a particular kind of performance, the greatest part of the authenticity is the performance itself involving an audience. My experience over the years with this text is it has become for me an oral experience. I'm, I'm responding much more to issues about time, quantity of, uh, of time needed to say a certain thing, uh, the, the musical events that are used to set up a certain performative moment, the way I isolate things using musical means. Um, all of those things have nothing to do with printed word. And actually, when I then go and read it from the printed page, uh, I'm deprived of all of my tools. And I fall back on the only thing I have as a reader and, and someone who reads out loud. I find myself uh, falling back on a kind of generalized reading skill that dates back to earliest childhood when you're called upon to read from a book uh, in front of your classmates. Uh, that, that whole feeling of being uh, trapped in the book comes back to me. And what I've found over the years of my performance is that I've been liberated finally from, from having to be chained to the printed word. And uh, that's, for me, the, the crux of, of the matter. And being, being trapped in the book, it's a, it's a nice phrase, because really that's what our cultural default is, that uh, our cognitive categories for understanding verbal art are set up by that very entrapment. And I think in, in terms of uh, looking at things the other way, when people try to take an oral performance, a living oral performance, and reduce, I would mm -hmm. emphasize that verb, reduce it to print, to turn it into uh, a book, then an awful lot of things, such as the ones you talk about, the musical flourishes, the vocal intonational flourishes, are lost, necessarily. And a great part of the performance, who knows what percentage, is thereby mm -hmm. lost. And the communicative nature of the performance, the connection with the audience, likewise lost. 
So there's a tremendous amount we sacrifice on the altar of the book in order to uh, satisfy our cultural default. Yeah. Exactly, and to emphasize a point that you just made in passing, we don't have direct access to the oral tradition by definition. If it's an oral tradition and not literate, well then there's no way we can channel those oral poets right. from 1,200 years ago. And, and we don't have the recording technology right. from them as, uh, from that time, as we have said. So all that we project back from the written text on the oral tradition is certainly speculative. But there are guides that we have what we don't know about Beowulf, um, the actual text itself is in, in many ways a lot more than what we do know about it because we don't know when it was composed. We have an idea of when it was written down based on the, on the manuscript dating, uh, which is uh, generally agreed to be a 10th century, 10th century manuscript. Uh, we don't know who put it on the page. Uh, we don't know why that person put it on the page. We really don't know where it got put on the page either. Um, th we do know that, that the uh, manuscript survived the Cottonian fire of 1731 when the uh, ironically named Ash Burnham House did just that and burnt to ashes. Um, so if one looks at the manuscript, you see all those singed edges and, and all sorts of things, but we don't. We, we don't, there's not a lot we know about the physical object Beowulf, and it's not unique for Old English Anglo-Saxon texts, or indeed for mid medieval texts. You know, it's rare that we can assign a text to a place, to a person, um, with any kind of surety. It's all just up in the air. That's right. We do know that there were two scribes involved right. Thanks. with writing out the text, whatever writing out the text meant, and that memory serves line 1939 is where scribe one ended, and Scribe 2 took over with a fatter right, hand. Right. Um, and different spelling of Beowulf. Different spelling Beowulf. Of, of a lot of things, yeah. Right. We also know that the first owner of Beowulf was Lawrence Noel, and right. that dates from 1767. So not until 1767, from the latter part of the 10th century, do we know much about the history of the Beowulf manuscript. Right. It's, it's important to say, I guess we've been implying it all along, that there is only the one of them. Right. and that it's embedded in a larger codex named uh, after Noel, the Noel Codex, which was in the Ashburnham Library, the Cottonian Library, under the bust of Vitellius. And that's why the manuscript is called Cotton Vitellius A15. But beyond those uh, facts, there isn't much to, to go on. Uh, I would distinguish, though, uh, an assumption we normally collapse and that is that the person who composed Beowulf wrote out this copy. Given the fact that it's two scribes and certain other manuscript indications that are probably too complex to talk about, this is at least a copy of a copy. And so we're, we're removed, um, at any rate, from the reality of oral performance in a number of scores, I think. A lot is sacrificed in the reduction to print. The more I think about the form of Beowulf as we have it, the more I think that maybe we've been asking the wrong questions, or I've been asking the wrong questions. And to my mind now, it's not how was this text performed, because I'm beginning to think that maybe this written text as we have it was neither a transcript of a performance nor a text for a performance but something that some monk in the silence of his cell put down on vellum with memories and experiences of performances in his mind so that I can't help but think from getting at this text from the inside, from the verse form, the meter, that all of the intricacies uh, of this form would have been impossible to project in the Mead Hall or in the monastery to an audience, I think there's the possibility that this was a text as we have it that was not meant to be performed, but that what Ben does re returns us to an earlier stage of a more expressive, more dramatic uh, performance. Yeah. Well, this, this is a, these words, dramatic and expressive, they're very important words for any performer, uh, also for any actor, reader, um, 
it would be interesting for us to think a bit about what we mean when we say expressive. Uh, because, for instance, I have an instrument um, that already provides us with some kind of formal structure, tonal structure, and rhythmic structure. And um, if I'm going to be expressive, whatever that word may mean, um, I, I still have the limitations that the instrument imposes on me. Then there's the, the metrical consideration of the text itself, which is going on on some level. But that's a question of degree. What level, uh, at which level am I respecting the metrics when I'm respecting them? And uh, in, in light of all of that, what are my options for expressivity? What, what do we mean when we say uh, expressive? Does that mean a shouting or uh, uh, making some particular kind of overly done accent on a given word or a given phrase? Um, it would be interesting for me to identify what all of you think of as the expressive elements of a performance. Well, the, the living performers, it's very much as you're saying that the music will override what they have to do. And I think of especially the South Slavic, chiefly Bosnian oral epic poets, where the melody that they learn for vocalization and playing the gusla, the bowed instrument, will often override the metrical niceties of what's going on. That is part of the performativity. That's part of the expressivity. So there is that dimension. And then one thing I'd add to what, what you two were saying, too, is that we have categories of reading versus performing which are much, much too absolute. Uh -huh. It's not simply a binary. And recent research that we all know about has shown that poets are actually rereading, reformulating, recreating. The scribes are doing that as they copy right. from one manuscript to the other. Now, if that can be done in writing when you're actually copying a manuscript reformulation, then the idea of uh, performing, whether or not the person is literate, whether or not the person is working from a text, uh, really involves a great deal more freedom than we would think of when we customarily think of a academic poetry reading, say, right. where somebody's got a copy of their chapbook right. and reading word for word uh, what it is. It's not that way at all in, right. in the world of, of oral poetry. Right.